today we are going to have uh, Aaron Labar do a, a bit of a presentation with the help of Olivia Michael Chuck. Um, so I will let them introduce themselves as they come up and then afterwards, um, after the presentation, you are free to work on your own press release and, and ask all the questions that you need and they can come around and give you some guidance and you can show an example of a press release you already have done. Um, so please utilize our time while they're here. Um, they're awesome, awesome people and thank you for being here. everybody. Sorry, I'm winded because I just ran up four flights of stairs to get here in time. Um, so I think I'm just, before we introduce ourselves, I just kind of want to go over what the plan is for tonight. So we're going to do our little intro. We're going to go over the package of information that we handed out to all of you. Both Olivia and I are going to chime in on certain things. And then I think we're going to take like a little 10 minute breather because three hours is like a long time to sit down and listen to everybody. And then um, I think we're going to break into small groups and we're going to work on um, forming your story and your angle and workshopping that with people because that's a very important part. Olivia's going to speak more to that later. And then, um, then you'll have your, <coughs> sorry, then you'll have your time to work individually on your relationships <coughs> and we'll go around and answer questions that you have. Sorry, I'm really winded. <laughs> I can start with my intro. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. You do that and I'll catch my breath. Totally. Uh, so my uh, perspective and lens on press releases is a little bit different than Erin because I uh, did writing part-time and currently I do it on a volunteer basis. So what my lens and I'm bringing to this is the volunteer perspective. You pitching your story to someone who does not have writing as a full-time job. So that's a little bit different in a sense that I have a lot less time than Aaron does, for example. I have a lot less patience, probably, than Aaron has because Aaron is probably getting stories that she really wants and I'm using stories that are nice and easy in some cases. Because when I was working at the Manitoban, if somebody dropped out of an article on Tuesday and it's due on Thursday, I look for the next easiest press release, the easiest person to get a hold of, and those types of things. So what my perspective is, is from the volunteer slash part-time writer perspective and how your press release can uh, be sent out universities, uh, magazines, all that type of thing where the employees of that uh, organization don't do that as a full-time job. So Aaron's is a little bit different though. <laughs> yeah, so I've been full-time at the Free Press for almost six years, almost five years as the music reporter, dedicated music reporter. For context, I get probably 20 to 30 releases a day in my inbox. And that's not including the other 200 emails from other people. So my perspective is coming from how to make your release stand out, um, how to keep it engaging, how to make me want to write a story worthy of 100,000 readers, right? So that's kind of where my perspective is coming from. Just a little background. Um, I did my master's degree in journalism in New York and I uh, interned for Rolling Stone, I interned for CMJ, interned for Disney, so I have a lot of diff a big breadth of understanding when it comes to different types of releases. So before we start, I just wanted to take a little poll. Is everyone here like an arts-based person or is there anyone else who's like not in the arts? What, what kind of releases are you guys looking to, to write? Um, I open up a wedding venue. Okay. And uh, our open house is this Sunday, and I'm just going to be doing that for about a week. And then I'll be doing some events in the public and getting volunteers and doing stuff in magazines and things like that. So okay. small articles and then just learning all the big times that, yeah. Okay, and someone else at hand here? Perhaps um, maybe when, when people speak, we can reiterate that for camera people? Oh, sure. So she just said that she's starting a wedding venue and wants to learn how to do, um, how to present herself and her venue in, in the form of a press release. Um, we're working in the environmental sector. Oh, okay, very cool. Okay, so I guess, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I work for a not-for-profit. Sorry? Not-for-profit. Oh, not-for-profit, okay. One more. One more, sorry. I work for a municipality. Okay, so we've got a very diverse group. Okay. Selkirk? 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 Okay. Okay, so I think we'll just start with the basics of what 
is a press release, which might sound like a very obvious thing, but people forget some very key aspects when they send them. So a press release is, or a news release is just a document that you send ahead of an important announcement, an important event that you want the media to know about and potentially cover. Um, you're going to want to include the information about the event or release, like the very basic points, what, where, when, why. You'd think that this is very obvious, but sometimes people forget <laughs> to include those things. Um, and this goes for political announcements, business openings, album releases, tour announcements, festival, and anything. Anything that, any news that you want to get to media, you're going to need to send a release. So, um, as you can see in your package, I've kind of broken it down into the parts that you should be including. So, um, sometimes people want to lead with a clever something or a very flowery something, but nine times out of ten, you're going to want to include the new pertinent information at the very top. So, that's what it says here. Uh, it's not a time to be vague or flowery. Vague is bad. You want to be concise and direct. Get to the point. No confusion. If you are, say, um, announcing an event, you want to have the date, the time, what the event is, right in the first paragraph. Because I don't want to have to search for that information. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, so, like, I don't have the time to search. I don't have the time to do a research project on you. You are giving me the information, and I am distilling that into an easily consumed uh, product for the public. So, like Erin was saying, don't make it flowery. Say, on December 27th, I will be playing at this thing. This is my band. Like, that is okay as an opening statement, because that's really important that we have all the information and from your first sentence, I can decide if I want to write about you. So if you make it difficult to find that information, it's kind of like not helpful. Yeah? So when, you, when you're saying about the topic of release, are you talking about the topic or the first the sentence? First the first paragraph. paragraph. The you're first paragraph. The, topic, the headline. No, I make the headline. Pardon? Like, you wouldn't give me a headline for an article. I mean, that he I'm just means like the title of the release. Oh, oh okay, I'm sorry. my own press release. So we're going to get to that in just a little bit, but it's a very good question. You'll be writing your own headline, um, but that's coming a little bit later. We'll talk about it. I know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that's okay. Can I, can I ask another question? Yeah, for sure. What's the, is there a difference between a news release and a press release? No, uh, it's just different language. Like when, uh, when we were writing in the paper, we follow Canadian press style, and the Canadian press style is to call it a news release rather than a press release. That's the only difference. People are sending me press releases about their projects, and then I take that information and decide whether I want to write the story about that. Okay. So we're going to talk about what that means and how to present your personal story for me to understand what your project is about. We're going to talk about that a lot, don't worry. <laughs> um, one thing that is important to note in this package is if you don't have specific details confirmed, if you don't know when your event is happening, you don't know when your launch is happening, you don't know when your album is coming out, don't send a release until you have all the information. Because it's very frustrating for me to be excited about writing a story and then you to come back to me and say, oh wait, this isn't opening for a month. Oh, the album got pushed back. So just make sure you have everything cemented before you reach out to media. So um, the next section is the explanation which is kind of what you were talking about with the story. And um, I might let Olivia, because I know you work a lot with bands on how to develop their sure. story and their angle, if you want to talk a little yeah. bit. <coughs> so uh, I, I did get press releases for, for bands, for art projects, all that type of thing. And it's really important to know um, who you are and who you're trying to reach. So when you're writing a press release, you can offer angles to the writer and say, uh, we, you have to explore your story, something that's interesting that's uh, about you. You can say, we're three best friends from kindergarten. That's interesting. 
like developing a band from that age or something. If you just say like, I'm a band and I want you to write about me, what's your angle? Like, what am I going to make a thousand words about? What am I going to make 500 words about? What am I going to make 300 words about? Like, give me anything, you know? So when you're writing your, your explanation or your history or things about that, you really have to explore who you are as an artist or as a municipality or as a wedding planner. Any of those things, you really need to find out who you are and why that story is worth writing. Um, why that story is worth writing, yeah. So that uh, I'm not trying to figure out why the story is worth writing in my particular instance, because I don't have time to figure out your story for you. And my perspective might be a little more cynical than <laughs> Aaron's because I've, uh, I'm also, while I'm writing these articles for, Mani for the uh, University of Manitoba newspaper, I'm also writing my thesis. So if you're making, I'm a trained researcher, that's my, my job, and if I can't figure out what your story is, then there's a problem. If I can't figure it out as a trained researcher what your story is, then who's going to figure it out? It's your responsibility to come to me and say, I have this story, this is a good person to talk to, you can call them and they'll answer you within a day, type of thing. That is ideal. Ideal. Make it as easy as possible for us to do our research project on you. Because essentially, we're doing a two hour, three hour, six hour research project on you, and if you can't even put an hour a day even and to figure out what your own story is then what are you expecting us to do the information can be lateral right it can move to other things um but i think the important thing is a lot of people don't feel what they're offering is unique they may not feel um that their project will stand out but guaranteed as soon as you start telling someone about what you're doing and who you are they're going to find something interesting about it so as long as you approach it with confidence and you portray the passion that you have, which you obviously do um, if you're so invested in your projects, people will engage with that and people will respond to that. So the kind of first step in figuring out what your story is, is to believe that you have one in the first place, I guess. Um, and then once you decide, once you decide what that is, be confident about it, be passionate about it, because you can't expect other people to be passionate about what you're doing if you are not to start with, right? So, I'm gonna just jump back a little bit to the history part. Um, a press release is not the same as a biography. And that is a mistake that happens a lot, where we get a release that's just, you know, six paragraphs of the things that you've done or the awards or whatever. That's something that you should put at the end as kind of like context. Right at the beginning, that's not what I care about. I care about what you're doing right now. So um, it isn't uncommon to have a separate document that is like a biography and lists all your accolades and your history and your education and all that kind of stuff, but that's not necessarily information that you should feel you have to include in the confines of a press release, because it is very short. And that's the trickiest thing about press releases is that they shouldn't be longer than, I would say, two pages maximum including your photos and links. So in that space, you have to be, you have to create engagement, you have to have all the information that you want, but you also have to be concise. And that's why they're very tricky. Which is not to say that a biography is not helpful. You should have your bio, I think, pre-press release. Have that all prepared and know what you're talking about, and then that is kind of like a, a thread in which you can weave your story. A thread that you can weave into your story, whatever. Get a bio also, you should also have a bio. But that's not the um, focus of a press release exactly, right. what Aaron was saying. Um, the next part is photos. Photos are so important. I cannot stress enough how important photos are. A lot of times a photo will be the difference between getting coverage and not getting coverage. Um, especially for the newspaper, which is the perspective I'm coming from. Every story has to have a photo that goes with it. And if you can't provide one and we don't have time to take a fresh one, then I can't do the story. And that's sort of the bottom one. So um, I've included some examples <laughs> of photos that are good and a photo that is bad. So the photo that's bad, I can, you can probably tell on your own why it's bad. It's very blurry. It's black and white. Can't tell who anybody is. Didn't come with any uh, names on the bottom. And I'm going to show you the color version 
of the one that's there because I only had a black and white printer. So this is a very good photo. Bright colors, interesting background, not just a guy standing on some train tracks. It's very good. Yeah, brick walls and train tracks, we say. Yeah. Steer clear. <laughs> Don't do brick walls and train tracks. And if you're doing it, if you're not a band, if you're doing an event, um, if you've had a previous event, make sure you attach photos from the year prior. If this is your first year, make sure you've thought about what kind of photos could be taken and let the person know that these are your options. Um, because again, cannot stress this enough, <laughs> photos are so important. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, even though you've worked in this paper, yeah. so maybe not now or later, you can give us, it must be like specific, like 3.5 mega, mega uh, MBs or like and how big that you guys like it. So like like the highest that. possible res. And like, but there must be a size to... We size them all, that's okay. And we size them all. Yeah. Because uh, the way that the paper's laid out, the photo sizes are going to change depending what day, what section, what page, the layout, if there's ads, if there's no ads. So the shape is going to change every single time. So I can see like a three gig photo. Oh, this is awesome. Yep. Preferably <laughs> one horizontal, one uh, vertical, color. Can't go wrong. Everybody write that down. That's yeah. an important piece of info. One uh, vertical, one horizontal. That's always great. color. Yeah. Uh, and at the back of this book, there is a list of media contacts that we can go through later that you will be able to send all these things to when you get them. Good question. Yes. Is it better to do something more specific event related or would like, the organization's logo or like season logo? Definitely something event related because photos are always, are always more engaging when there's action or movement or something that's not just like stationary, right? Yeah, especially if it's a, say a festival and you're doing it the second or third year, you want to send a photo that shows that there was 5,000 people there or that there was interest, right? So, yeah. yeah. Also a really great thing is if you put the caption underneath, photo left to right, you can say John Smith, bass, whoever, whatever. If you put all the names and instruments, if you're in a band or whatever the photo is, if you make your own caption, super, super helpful because that also can get incorporated into the article, so I don't have to ask who the bassist is because it says in the photo already. So if you provide the caption, super, super helpful. Do you think so? Absolutely. Great. Yeah, Yeah, we get yelled at by our editors all the time when we don't, we're not able to um, identify people in the photos, and then we get yelled at by people who send the photos and we ID them incorrectly. So you could help both of us out and just send in the IDs for the photos. That's yeah. awesome. And the ease, like, Every single piece of information that you're putting into here, like even just having the names and instruments there already is like, okay, I don't have to find that piece of information. Oh, I don't have to find that piece of information. Like every piece of research that you save us from is like another step towards getting your article written about over the Joe Schmo. Yeah, definitely. I'm not saying that I won't look you up, but if you include a photo and you include a link to whatever you're doing and all I have to do is click on it rather than Google you, it's like 85% <laughs> more likely that I'm gonna follow through with that and possibly write a story. Um, we're gonna, when, we're in the, when you guys are in your groups, you'll talk more about your story and we can talk more about the actual like writing process because I think it'd be easier to do that in smaller groups, do you agree? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the reaching out to media part, because that's the part that I know most about. <laughs> um, there, there kind of is a divide in the way people approach this, I find. Either it's like super, super formal, or I have some kid DMing me on Instagram. Formal is definitely preferable over the Instagram, but um, I think it's important to remember that the people you're emailing are just, uh, like we're just people. You don't have to treat us like we're royalty. <laughs> you <laughs> this, could. I mean, you could, um, but the okay. sir madam is, is unnecessary. You want to be professional, but not, I don't know what's the right, like overly formal, I guess. Um, yeah, like robotic. Yeah, robotic. yeah. Like I'm not the queen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm not royalty. I'm yeah. Like a so queen. what I often suggest is to do a bit of research on who you're reaching out to, the publication that they write for, get familiar with the kind of regular stories or regular series that go into the paper or magazine or website. 
that your pitches are specific because if it looks to me like you've done your research, I'm more inclined to invest more time in you because you've invested time in pitching to me. So what I often suggest is to start like a normal email, write a body uh, directed specifically to me or whomever you're contacting. <coughs> Say, I noticed you write stories about this or I noticed that you covered this and um, this is what I'm doing, my release is below. Copy and paste your release into the body of the email because attachments suck, don't do that. Just drop it in the body of the email, leave your contact information at the bottom and if they want to get back to you, they will. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, well, this is something that contradicts what you say. Okay. Um, personally, I like when you copy the press release into the email and then also attach it. Mm. So that way it's in two locations or if I don't have internet access for whatever reason, I have that press release saved as like a Word document. I don't have to copy and paste it. So usually if somebody, um, it's great to leave it in the body of the pair, uh, email, I agree with that. But I also think that adding an attachment of the press release and the photo additional to that would be helpful for me. For example, if I was doing that article, I would download them and when I'm on the way to university, I can write it on the bus, which is a little bit different because you're not on your way to university and writing it on the bus. But again, that's, would you, you wouldn't ignore one that had an attachment on it, right? So if you add, I would say do both. Be safe and uh, put the press release in the body of your email. Does everybody understand what that means? Yeah. And then also make a Word document and attach it and put like, Juniper Bush underscore tour coming up underscore Olivia Michaelchuk. And then that's nice and easy to find or whatever. Yeah. Just, yeah. Um, and then in terms of actually reaching out to media, I know that social media is a very popular way to contact people. And if you are reaching out to someone who is an influencer who does all of their work on social media, then it's probably appropriate to do that. But for people that, like myself and other people who work at the paper and Olivia, our email addresses, our phone numbers, our contact information in a professional sense is all readily available with one Google. My email address is at the bottom of every story that I write. So when people contact me on my, pers my personal Facebook page or my Instagram page, it just tells me that A, they don't read the paper, B, they haven't taken time to look at anything, and I delete those right away. I never respond to them. So um, again, it all comes down to <clears throat> doing your research on who you're pitching, and how and where they work, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, I think I said this a little bit earlier, but we're gonna do a two to three to six to eight, however long research project on you, the least you could do is Google our names. So um, I worked at the Manitoban, and there is such a high turnover with the same email address. So people would say, hey Katie, or hey Seamus, I think you should read this, which tells me that they have um, uh, promoters that are like not actually looking at those things and they just have an email list from five, four, three years ago. So I immediately, if anybody says hi, anyone other than my name, it's just immediate deletion. It doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter how cool they are or like, oh, this would be a great story. Uh, that's not my name. And you're not paying attention and you don't care. Yeah. So the question was, um, uh, if you can't find the name, no matter how hard you try, generally, and I'm not saying that you didn't try as hard as you could, but for the publication, they like they will have the name at the end of it, or, or generally you can find it, it's just a matter of correctly researching, or maybe a roundabout researching way. So for example, on the Manitoban, it has contacts, and it has the names of every single person in all their emails, I'm sure that's the same at the Winnipeg Free Press. Um, if it's like a podcast and you don't know their names, you gotta listen to it. The first 10 seconds they'll introduce themselves or something, you just have to take that extra step to try and find that. And you can say like, also you could just say like, hey, how's it going? But like, it is good to know what my name is and it generally, no. I would say 95% of the time you can find it or figure it out. And that 5% of the time, it's like, well, 
if you if you're contacting an anonymous person, that's probably not worth it. <laughs> if they're an anonymous author, then I don't know if that's exactly the best place to be going. But yeah. Yeah, all of our emails and phone numbers are available. Every publication that I know, the emails and phone numbers are available. I'm not sure who we were reaching out to, but we also do have a general arts inbox. So you could always send it there if you don't have a specific person that you know you want to reach out to. Um, most major publications will have like a general inbox where things go, but you do take the risk of things getting lost in there because there are literally thousands of emails <laughs> that go there on a weekly basis. So if you can, it's always best to like pick a person individually and email them because those general inboxes can be a bit of a minefield for sure. And what about the subject heading for, ah. oh, are you coming It's next, yes. Yeah. I would say that if you have someone that you've worked with previously at the paper, someone who's responded to you, someone who's written a story about something you've done, you should always try them first because you already have that relationship. Uh, and if not, you can certainly continue to send it to more than one person because we all sit within about three feet of each other. So if we all get the same release, we'll be like, hey, do you want to do something? Should you do something? Um, but I still would always suggest focusing on trying to find one person. So oh, yeah. Like that one person. So I, are you talking about at the same publication? Yes. Okay, that's yes. different. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I thought you were talking about like, oh, no. Do I do it to like the no, side no, of the free press? Like every press or CBC, you know, your, your list has 10. Yeah. <laughs> How long do I wait before I move on to the next person? Well, you, you would research which person writes about what you are talking about. And then if they don't, they're not interested in that type of thing, and you follow up and they still don't answer, then I would say... Move on. Yeah, move on or take a look at your release. So we are asked a question about sending it to maybe a radio station with like several people that would play it. So if you want to... Uh, hit like prairie hits. That, well, a radio station is a little bit different. It's for example, like CKUW or UMFM, because those people probably don't ever see each other. They come in for their one hour show and then they leave. So, sending it to prairie hits and sending it to uh, new releases or whatever, sending it to all of those people is important. And also taking the time to say, Hi, Prairie Hits, I'm from the Prairie and this is a hit. Hi, whatever, like, say why you think that your thing, so if you pick five shows on CKUW that you think are important, just do a one sentence why you think that show should play uh, your song. Yeah. Or why they think, why you should think they should interview and say, oh, I saw you did an interview with Begonia. I think you should do an interview with me also because my songs are similar to hers, and I have a cool story. This is a story we did in my press release, sort of thing. Right. I think. And right? error for you, if like yeah. it was like I call it because got the same press release, but it was you got it too, and you're both personalized, but the content is the same. That would be a turn off. No, not at all. We understand that people are not going to spend 50 years of their life catering a press release for every individual person because that's not your job either. Yeah. You're a musician. Yeah. You that's music is your job. Your job is not. Well, I guess it is a little bit of promotion too, but I don't expect everyone to like completely bend over backwards just because oh, I'm important. <laughs> no, definitely not. Um, but we can tell the difference between five minutes and ten seconds. Absolutely, yes. And I just uh, I wanted to bring up an example of sort of the value of research before a cold pitch. Um, does everybody know the singer Olivia Lani? She's a local singer. She just uh, won an episode of The Launch on CTV. Sing her song, people will know. Oh god, I can't sing. <laughs> You've heard it, trust me. I got you. That one. Da, da, yeah. Um, so she, <laughs> you know, with the two notes. Um, she, when she was probably 16, sent me an email just out of nowhere saying, Hey, I see that you guys are doing this video session called The Exchange Sessions. I am an aspiring singer-songwriter. I think my new single would be a great fit for this. How do I get involved? And she sent me her link to her music. She sent me like a very brief bio. And then a week later, we shot a video with her and it was up on the Free Press website. And all I took was one email that showed even a modicum of research that she had looked at our website. She had found a niche that she would fit into and she wrote about it and sent it to me. And I said, okay. And that's all it took. When you start like BCCing and CCing a bunch of people, you start to get into that like form email territory, which is kind of a turnoff. I don't know. How do you feel about that? Yeah. Uh, I, 
I feel similarly in a sense that instead of CCing, you shouldn't just copy and paste the body of the email. Um, yeah, or you can say like forward and then delete the thing that says forward and then just send it to somebody else without it being a CC or a BCC. You, there's really simple ways of doing it where you're avoiding blanketing someone as though like, I'm just gonna send this to everybody. Like, I don't wanna feel like you're just sending it to everybody either because we could end up writing the exact same story as somebody else. But like, if you're pitching me an angle or uh, personalized, but yeah, if you're sending it to like, I work like, uh, like dear Olivia and Jen, that's okay because it's like, okay, I'm sending it to both of you and either of you is fine and that's okay. If you're acknowledging that you're sending it to more than one person, but if you're sending it to like the University of Manitoba, University of Saskatchewan, that no, don't do that. Just uh, but specifically pitching it to shows, um, I think that it's not good to CC or BCC because you should be explaining why specifically you think that your song should be on their specific show. Yeah, which is only a sentence or two max. There's also always the risk of us accidentally replying all and getting lost in the loop of oh my 400 replies, which is something we like to avoid. No. Um, okay, so at the back of this package, I included a few examples of press releases, and I thought maybe we could look at them, and you guys could tell me what you think is successful about them and what you think is unsuccessful. So most of these are not local. Okay. So the question was how to make your concert, event, whatever, stand out during the holiday period, which is absolute madness. Um, my suggestion would be to reach out probably a month ahead, be like, hey, just so you know, this thing is coming up, because I often actually do, and I'm only speaking for myself here, but I do an event roundup at the beginning of December, and I just write about everything that's happening for the entire month in one shot. So if, if you email me, November 20th, I'm going to put it in my folder and say, oh, I'm going to circle back to this when it comes time to do this roundup. Um, if you're looking for more specific solo coverage, I would still say a month before and then just follow up two weeks prior. Be like, hey, just a reminder, this is happening. And then follow up a week prior. That's okay. exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. So that's perfect. I think people sometimes wonder how many follow-ups is too many follow-ups. Uh, some people differ with me on this because they get annoyed, but um, I understand that coverage is very important, so I don't mind so much if it's like uh, you send me something three weeks, then you send me something a week later, and then a week later, and then a few days later. Uh, generally speaking, we say two weeks prior to any event launch announcement is the golden time to send your release. Um, we don't write stuff a day before it goes to print. We write stuff several days or even a week before it goes to print. So by giving us a two-week window, you're giving us ample time to interview you, to get a photo if we need to, um, to research you, to do all this stuff to make the story successful. So more time is always better, I would say. For me though, uh, <laughs> more time is better, but I don't have two weeks to write. I would uh, start the article on Monday and hand it in on Thursday type of thing. So I would have four days to do it, uh, which means that, um, yeah, like you were saying, the, the two week and then the one week, if I am strapped, like the person who was supposed to respond to me on Monday and I wrote 90% of the article but they didn't answer me with any quotes, and this person who's persistent and did two weeks, one week, a few days, I'm like, okay, I don't, maybe I don't want to write this story because I didn't contact them two weeks or one week ahead of time, but they're so persistent that I know that if I phone them, they're going to answer the phone because they want this article so badly. So it's just like, you know what? Have it. You know, like sometimes. Persistent pays. I, I think persistence pays more than it doesn't. There, you can get annoyed with a release, but you never get so annoyed with a release that you're like, I'm gonna completely ignore this person. You, and I found this with my podcast as well, is that the people that are persistent, even if you don't want to talk to them, <laughs> which I haven't done yet, but if you don't want to talk to them and you're strapped and somebody bails last second, you're like, this person was right up my butt and they want this so badly that I'm just gonna do it because I can call them and they'll be here in 10 minutes. Or I can call them and they'll answer the phone and I can write this article quickly, concisely. I don't know if that's the same, but. Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, I mean, it does happen. We do get people who bail on stories, but 
I mean, the two week rule is only just for my like forward planning. I, I don't actually spend two weeks working at all. Yeah. yeah, no, we spend just like a couple hours, but um, oh, I lost my train of thought now. I think we were just talking persistence about persistence. Pays. Yes, persistence pays. Um, don't feel that you're annoying us. Don't feel that you're being overbearing. Don't, like, that's our job is to receive information and then disseminate it to the public. So send your releases, just send them and send them and send them. And if you don't get a response, don't take it personally. If you don't get a response, it probably was because I forgot or it got lost in my inbox, which is why the follow-up is so important. Because mm -hmm. sometimes I flag things and then they get pushed down. And, and uh, I'd say nine times out of 10, if it's coming from a local organization or a local artist or, or someone based in Winnipeg or Manitoba, I will respond whether I am going to move forward with the story or not. So um, just keep that in mind as well. <laughs> I try. I mean, people take the time to, to reach out, so I like to respond. Yeah. yeah. Did you have another question? Uh, last one. Uh, if you have it in here, uh, just best practices for subject heading. If it is yes. So, um, if you are in Winnipeg and you're pitching to a Winnipeg media outlet, put something about being local in the subject head because that immediately, in my inbox, makes you stand out as something that I should probably take a look at. Because I'm getting releases from Vancouver, from PEI, from the States, from Europe. Things that don't even apply to me at all, they just mass email us. So if you put Winnipeg based whatever or local whomever in your subject head, I will at least read it, see it, notice it. I would say, is yeah. that same for you? Yeah. Um, well, I guess you're mostly getting pitched by local people, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I would say the most important things will uh, don't put like a sentence. You can be like, uh, local band dash half moon grown dash September 25th show at the Garrick. So like I have all of those things at the top but I know that I have to write this article before the September 25th because it's all in the subject heading and then it's also easy to find again and also when I'm sc scrambling to find an article and I'm scrolling through and I was like oh the show's only in like four days it's perfect I wasn't going to write about it before sorry but now I'm going to write it because it's only four days away and I can do this right now so that's it I think um, like who you are, <coughs> where you're from, what you're doing in the day in the subject heading is helpful for me. What do you think? Yes, for sure. You don't want to, as Olivia said, you don't want to write a whole sentence, but um, and you can expand on what your subject head is in the headline of the press release. So that's sort of like the next part. Um, and what your headline should be is like the most important information of your release synthesized into basically a sentence. Yeah. So that actually takes will take some time to sit and think about. Like what is the most important thing that you want people to know about this release? Like what's coming ahead as you keep reading. So if you're announcing, I don't know, you're gonna be at the wedding show and your announcement is my new booth is open, like that should be part of your headline. That's what you want up there. Um, if you're a band and you're releasing an album, this album name out this date tour to follow yeah. like that's you want to synthesize everything that you're saying below concisely and cleanly as possible yeah um i would say also use any um well personally if somebody says like uh whoever touring with critically acclaimed blah like something that's you gotta, you gotta be conscious of how long a subject heading actually is, but also doing something semi-impressive within it, I think is helpful. If it's like a sentence, if I only see like one capital letter within it, I'm just like, delete, you know? Like uh, something that has like information, 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 and it's like attention grabbing, because we're human, right? We're, anything that you see in your inbox where it like pops up and it's something attractive and you look at it even though it's like an ad for like Purina or something like <laughs> it still caught your eye and why did it catch your eye because it said whatever in all caps or because they put stars uh, around the word or something be conscious of your surroundings in your inbox because we get the same things to our inbox so making something look attractive look at your inbox and see what's attractive first you know, and see, look in your inbox and see what's not attractive. And then make 
a guideline for yourself. The subject heading is so strangely important, isn't it? Wow. Yeah. Notice what attracts your attention when you're doing yours and try to mimic that. Press releases is a lot about mimicking the easiest way to do things or the most attractive way to do things. So I think that's important. Yeah, there you will see some of this. It will make more sense when you look at the examples uh, a little further on in your package. But one thing uh, I wanted to mention before I forget is that it's always useful to have somebody who uh, is perhaps not involved with the event that you are promoting proofread your release to make sure that you didn't forget something. Because sometimes when you're so deep into something, it's second nature for you to just know those things, so you forget to actually like write them down and put them on paper. And I do that in stories all the time, where I've just thought about things so much that I thought I wrote them, but then I didn't. And, um, and also just, if you've read something too many times, you start to miss typos, spelling mistakes, grammatical errors, it's just really important to just get one or two extra sets of eyes to, to read something before you send it out. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. Any other questions right now? Is there a bad day or time to send a news release? Friday afternoon, don't do it. Um, Monday morning, because you're filtering through all the weekend garbage that floated through. Um, some people check their email on weekends. I try not to just because work-life balance is kind of important. Um, I would say like Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday afternoon, those are kind of my times where I'm just clicking around, looking at things. Um, for our art section, I don't know if it's useful for you guys to know like when my deadlines are for certain stories, but um, our Thursday, Friday, Saturday sections are pre-printed earlier in the week. So my Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday are very, very busy. And then Thursday, Friday tend to like calm down a little bit. Um, but yeah, I would say like Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday afternoon for me personally is the best time. Yeah, I would say <coughs> I would say take a look at when the majority of that publication publishes. Or sometimes on their website they'll say that they publish. So a university newspaper happens every uh, every week, or stylus for example happens every two months. So know those things and make sure that. Um, so like stylus's deadline is September 20th for the October-November edition. So you can't get into the magazine unless you've submitted already. So if you have something coming up in December, you should be doing after September 20th, like in October or something, two months in advance. You can also ask. You could just like phone or email those places and ask them what their schedule is, if that's something that you're really interested in getting in. But yeah, typically... Well, for us, well, I can't remember. I can't even remember. Or like, often on my podcast, I say like we record four episodes on the first Sunday of the month. So if you're contacting me in the middle of the month, then you're at the back of my mind for the first Sunday of the month. I don't know. Just pay attention to the places that you actually want to get um, press for. You have to care about them as much as they're attempting to care about you. If you're doing a, an event in the summer that's unrelated to a festival, it's going to be really difficult to do coverage. Not because we don't want to, but because we just physically can't. Because we are covering Jazz Fest, Country Fest, Folk Fest, Bridge Fest, Folklore Emma, back to back to back, from the end of June to the middle of August. So if you have an event that falls somewhere in there, try or just try to avoid having an event that falls somewhere in there, because it's just it's it's very difficult for us to sway from our festival coverage. Uh, and also there's a federal election coming up, and for newspapers it's a very busy time, so if you're going to pitch stuff, probably don't do it on that day, and just sort of like pay attention to what's happening around you at the businesses that you're going to be pitching to, I would say. If it's an event that you're looking to get specific coverage for two weeks before, um, media, well I guess you're coming from a different kind of sector. Yes. yes. So I guess it would probably be, I would say for you, probably one week before, just because the news cycle moves a little bit faster than the arts and life cycle. Um, but if it's something that you're hoping to get a reporter at, hoping to get cameras at, you want to give them time to prepare for that, right? So I would say a week before. And then if you're doing like a post uh, presser release, like as soon as possible, because they're going to want that information. And if there was someone who was unable to make it to your press 
announcement, they're going to want that information if they need to write a story and they were unable to attend, right? So generally speaking, a media advisory is much more bare bones than a press release. It's just like, if you, if you um, look at the last example, that's a media advisory. Uh, it's the one from the Wall to Wall Festival. And it literally just has date, time, place, who's speaking, who's available for interviews, and that's it. And that's basically, where did it go? Is it up here? Yeah, the, the yeah. Wall. yeah. It starts here. Oh yeah, it got a little messed up in printing. But um, yeah, so this is an example of a media advisory. Who, where, when, what's gonna be there to take pictures of? who's available to speak, and that's what it, what it is. I would say for a news release, do one week, two days, and then the morning of, just because one week is like giving them enough time if they want to put that on their schedule. Two days is like, oh, I, I flagged it and it's at the bottom, and day of is like, this person had a story that fell through and you're their saving grace. Can it be the same thing that you're Yeah, saying? it should be the same thing. It should be, um, if you're doing a reminder, I would say if you're doing a reminder, send the full press release again. Because you don't want to say, hey, it's just me again. Um, scroll through your 30 messages a day to four days ago. So through 120 messages to try and find my press release again. You should just be say, sending the same thing with like a different set of uh, body text, which is only a couple sentences. Yeah, I can, sorry, I'm just going to give a brief example um, for something like Cirque or like the, I call it the horse circus, but Odyssey Ocavalio when they were here, they would always, just out of a courtesy, send me a press release ahead of time so that I knew it was going to happen at the press conference, and then when the conference was over, they would send that release out to everybody else. So it's the same release, it just, they sent it to me a little bit early so that I had the information. Yeah. Questions? Sorry, go ahead. Okay. Yes. So the way it works for me is I will send out a media advisory two, three days before something. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking, let's say I send it to Mark Cash. And then he gets back to me saying, can I have a story? Can I have a release? My response is no, because I already have my story written. And then I want it published full, like, including all the information that I want to have there. So the media advisory is just to draw the media there. Mm -hmm. and then So you're sending like a fully formed story, like with an intro and, a, and right. quotes and body. correct me if I'm wrong, but the response to that is probably either you want the story or you don't. Either you send me the release and you want me to cover this and you want to be helpful and you want to give me the information that I need, or you don't. So do you not appreciate a fully written story already? No. No, because we wouldn't run that anyway. That's Martin's job is to take the information that you give him and to distill it into something for our readers. Because we work for the readers, right? We're not, we don't work for you. So, uh, we're responsible to take the information that you give us, and we decide what's the important information, and we give that, which I know is hard from your perspective, but that's sort of just how it works. But if I gave you the information prior to the event taking place, then we would write the story. You'd write the story, but it would run before the like. Not necessarily. There's something called an embargo. Do you know what that means? Yeah. Yeah, so that is something that people can use. We're not super keen on that either. 
Um, but basically an embargo just means that someone is sending you information with a restriction on what time you can publish it or where. So say, um, folk festival. It's not wrong to send that or to request that. To it's, it's not wrong, but we don't love it. Like for example, we'll do it for folk fest because they'll give me the lineup a month ahead of time and I have to sign a confidentiality waiver that says I will not tell anyone before they release it. And we have that agreement with them that's been long standing for a long time, but yeah, we generally don't love it, but in your circumstance, it seems like that's what you would want to happen, because we wouldn't, Not yeah. Not me necessarily, I'm just the tutor. <laughs> yeah, but we, we wouldn't run a story that you gave us, because that would be like running a story that someone in public relations wrote already, so. Yeah, I would say, I would say that there are biases attached to that, in a sense, so for, the Manitoba, and we do accept uh, volunteer pieces, but the volunteer would be writing it about an event that they admire or an album that they like, not an event that they ran themselves. And I mean, it might be an interesting angle to talk about an event that you ran yourself, but then that would be the story would not be the actual event. I think. Yeah, so I, I would say, in a, I will share with you my gut reaction to what you were saying in a sense that um, I feel as though I'm not re being respected as a non-biased journalist to write your story and you're sort of spoon feeding me and saying like, I know what I'm saying and I know what I want my story to be, so I'm just going to give it to you exactly and it's like, but I'm a journalist. Yeah. My job is to make your information the information for the public, and by you making your information already ready for the public, what do you need me for? And I'm paid and it's my job. So I'm gonna write it the way that I wanna write it instead of being told the way that I wanna write it. So sending a media release or sending a press release is giving all the information in order for me to take my journalistic perspective, my professional journalistic perspective, especially Aaron's, um, less so mine, more so Aaron's, and saying my spin on this is more important than your spin on this, my words are more important than your words, but we are trained, we are professionally trained researchers and writers in order to write the story in the way that is consumable by the public and accepted by our editors. Do you think that's fair? Yeah, definitely. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just also I think it's... it's a super arrogant thing. I, would, I, don't, I don't know if it's arrogant, but it's also just a waste of your time. Like, well, it, it it's like, me, I, it's see, I see it as a yes. in a sense. I see it as someone that's giving me, as a journalist, taking away my power. Yeah, I can see that. That I've developed over eight, ten years. Yeah. It depends on who you're writing to, because that's two different perspectives from... And yeah, there's a perspective, too, where it's, it has been appreciated in the past. You know, I, I'm not going to run it like you send it to me, but all the information... The press release is providing the information for me to write it in the first place and saves you time. Yeah, totally. And also I have in a note uh, in the tips section, um, this has been a kind of a recent trend where public relations people and management people have been requesting specific run dates, specific story locations. That is not an okay thing to do. It is up to the editors of our paper where those stories run, when they run. So I would not suggest going so far as to as to suggest what day or where in the paper you want your potential story to run. You you think it doesn't happen, but it does. Yeah, make it easy, but don't do our jobs. That's where I would draw the line. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, it's just it's sort of um, part of your question and part of your question. It's sort of what is the purpose of the press release? Because I am uh, running a gala for our film awards. Mm -hmm. Sure. To do this. So the first press release for the first set of media advisory or press release, we're trying to attract attention. We're trying to get people 
Yeah, so exactly. So got an award. Now, although there might be a group first reporter at that event doing their own story, that we don't necessarily know that's going to happen. So that's when I would send out something that was written by us, but I don't know if that then offends, offends the newspaper or the people who are getting it because... No, I think that's a little bit different <laughs> because you are saying this, you're doing a recap. This is what happened at our event. These are the winners. I think it's a little bit different than, than this example over here. Well, not really. So then how do you get that out? Because that's where I find, you know, we kind of, I feel like we've exhausted our energies just trying to get attention for the event. But then after, for our members, we really want the winners publicized. We want the, the success of the event publicized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to be very honest about this. If we cover an event and we do a preview story or we do a story at the event, it's very unlikely that a second or third story is going to follow immediately after. It's sort of like uh, when a festival does a three-day rollout of their announcement. I'm not going to write about those the the uh, of their sorry of their lineup announcement. I'm not going to write about day two and three. I'm only going to write about day one. You're one festival, you get one story. So that's. You kind of have to choose on your end, like, am I going to push for a preview to get people there, or am I going to push for an after story about who won? Because there's probably not going to be both. Or could you use a media advisory, or what we used to call a public service announcement? Could you just print that? No. No. So there's no point in doing that? Well, there's not no point. I mean, I'm sure there are people who you're sending it to who are very interested in finding out yeah. who won, but I just, uh, just to be very blunt, we generally don't cover a single event more than one time. Uh, I would say if you're if you're attempting to do a before and after, and you're doing the before because you want actually people to actually come, it would be fair to ask the reporter afterwards, "Can you run 200 words about just all the winners, or like a very small like section of it?" It, it is like you have to kind of choose the before or the after, um, but I think that sometimes it's fair to ask the reporter if they would be willing to. That would be your best bet, same person that covered before. I unless, just, yeah. oh, Aaron, I just remember something. No, I don't disagree. Oh, okay. um, if you know winners ahead of time, you can give it to them. Yeah. You never know winners ahead of time? No. Because I know when we cover some of the book awards and things like that, they give our reporter the winners ahead of time so that they. So they, when they publish their recap of the night or their story, um, they have the list of winners in a sidebar that go with the story because they have them ahead of time and they can run them the next morning. So that's something to consider for sure. But then that would have the, I can't remember the word the they embargo. used. The embargo, yeah. yeah. But if it's yeah. running the day after the event anyway, then that probably would not be an issue, but yeah. Are there any other questions before we take a break? So you had mentioned one week For me, just because my deadlines are a little early, so just to give like a more concrete example, if your event is on a Saturday, I have to finish that story by Wednesday night. So if you don't send me a release until Monday, and I already have things planned for my Monday and Tuesday, then it makes it really difficult. So for me, I would say like at least four days before, four business days, four or five days. That would be sort of the cutoff, but preferably two weeks ahead. Yeah. That was for a news release. That that's a little bit different because we're doing like arts. So arts is a little bit different because we have a much more time. But news release, people write an article and it comes out the next morning, or write an article and it comes out two hours later. So their example is a little bit different than an arts example. I would say two weeks, one weeks, four days is pretty reasonable. Don't you think? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Just yeah. because to kind of explain it a little more thoroughly if anyone's confused um the news cycle all the reporters most of the reporters are getting an assignment on a tuesday and it's going to be in the paper on a wednesday i'm getting an assignment the previous tuesday and it's going to go in the paper the following thursday like a week and a half later 
So their turnaround is typically a lot quicker, which is why you can kind of set things just a few days before, just to give a heads up. But for us, it's a little bit, we need a bit more lead time. Yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes we do have events. Uh, so in the case of uh, sending a news release a week in advance, we went several days in advance, does that kind of hinder uh, the kind of audience or people that we can get to send events? Should we be sending it further in advance or then we just talk about it? Like yeah, I would say like the week, three days before is actually really good for that. Um, only because unlike us, they're only planning like a day or two in advance and we're planning like a week or two in advance. Um, and there's like there's no harm also in reaching out if you want to reach out two weeks before and say, hey, just a heads up, like, um, sorry, it's named Daniel, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, mentioned earlier, be like, hey, th this event is coming up. We'll be sending you a more formal release next week, but just so that you have it in your calendar, this is what's coming up, just so you're aware because everybody has a calendar, they're always putting stuff in. So yeah, it never hurts to reach out a little bit early, even if it's just informally. Any other questions? Is there too far in advance? Because our release is usually going to the tickets go on sale for our shows. Which is often a month or two in advance. Um, well, that's different because your releases are serving a specific purpose to say that ticket on sale is in a couple days, right? So it's not really that far in advance because you're, you're your, the purpose of your release is to say, hey, this show's happening, tickets are on sale. Um, and then, since we work together a lot, you always, or Jason, reaches out like two weeks before to remind me that the show's coming up. So uh, for that, I think you're fine to send it coinciding with your ticket release, because that's what you want people to know. Yeah. Yeah, but it depends on what you want the story on, because Aaron was mentioning you usually don't get several stories. So if you want it to be about the ticket release, then you can send it about the ticket release. But if you want it to be about the show, then two weeks in advance is better because you can interview the artist. Or just resend it. Out. Just re do it. send it to everybody for your ticket release and then resend it to me as a reminder two weeks before the show. Yeah. yeah. But if you want your ticket release, the thing to be uh, like the focus of the show, then that's, you, you kind of, yeah, again, you sort of have to decide. Mm -hmm. Do you want pre-coverage, post-coverage, ticket coverage, show coverage? album coverage, whatever you want, you have to pick. If you have five events, pick one. Or like five instances, moments, you have to decide which one you want. Mm -hmm. And cater to that specifically. Yeah. just to help us see things literally in our inboxes because as I said things get lost they fly under the radar so easily and like a five second forward reminder email from you may may result in the coverage that you want. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions? What about phone calls? Do you like phone calls? I personally hate phone calls and I understand <laughs> that I'm in the communications <laughs> industry so that's not great. I mean, I have my, my phone number is is there. Um, for whatever reason, I find the people who typically call are very, and I'm not saying that this is you, I'm just saying my experience has been people are very abrasive on the phone and they are like very overwhelming. Um, but I mean, there's no harm in calling if you're gonna just be like a polite person. But I just, <laughs> I just found in the past, especially the last year or so, every phone call that I've gotten has just been like, a very abrasive, like aggressive man, like yelling at me. So I, I typically screen my calls, to be honest. Yeah, I would say phone calls should be reserved as a reminder that you sent an email, perhaps. Um, you shouldn't phone and say, hey, I've got a story for you. You should say, hi, I don't know if you saw in your inbox, we have this article coming up. I'd be, I'm super willing to do an interview right now. Might be a little bit easier, or, or I'm available a little bit later in the day, like be very, um, bend very easily to the atmosphere that they are in, which is very, we, they, I'm saying, yeah, yeah, so I'm <laughs> imagining myself at the Winnipeg Free Press, but like in an atmosphere that's very fast paced is something and uh, having a fast paced phone call 
is kind of just adding to the anxiety. I had a, a slow sort of like, hey, <laughs> you know, like, I sent you an email. I'm super willing to do an interview. I'm sorry, blah, 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 if this is not a good time, you know, just be polite and kind and willing to be a breath of fresh air if you are making that phone call. But I would say phone calls should be reserved for reminding people about emails. And then, um, <laughs> don't you think? Yeah, no, and I then think sort of like, like um, the age we live in. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the remind them about an email and say like, I'm available all afternoon. So if you have time to look at the press release, that would be great. Or I've just resent the press release. So it says at the top, like they can just check their inbox as they're on the phone with you and see that it's at the top. And then be like, oh, this is so nice. This person was so kind and they want to talk to me this afternoon and the story is taken care of for me. Perfect. But also, my phone number is not available. So, <laughs> can't do that for you. Mine is, but we're like baby deer. You have to approach very slowly and quietly. Exactly. Um, I would also add that um, when you're telling someone stuff over the phone, they're probably not going to remember everything you said. So it's always good, as Olivia said, to follow it up with sending the press release. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, that's a great. That's showing that you're engaged, which is wants us to engage in return. Just be like, hey, just calling to see who I should send this to, and if hopefully it's me, and I'd be like, oh, just me. This is great. Mm -hmm. This is nice. You're engaged, and you actually care, and you found my phone number, and you want to be involved. Yeah, and anything that shows that you've taken a modicum of effort makes me really excited. So that's great. Um, so before we continue, sorry, uh, I just included a list of media contacts. I just um, did the email formula so that you can contact any one of these organizations just using this formula for free press. It's first name dot last name at freepress.mb.ca. I looked up some from the other media outlets. Um, so this is your guide to contacting everybody you want to save this forever. Um, I would say, yeah, for you now you're COVID and stylist. Each section has an editor email. So Manitoban for the art section is arts at the Manitoban. Probably the same at the Uniter. Uh, stylist <coughs> the editor because that's a volunteer base. So mm -hmm. that's the only email that you're getting it to. But editor will send it to the top person, and they will. It's part of their responsibility to disseminate those throughout the various departments. And I would get emails from the editor and be like, "This person emailed me twice. Do this article." And just a reminder, these are all Googled within about 15 seconds. So everything is very available to you, but just so now that you have it here. This is a checklist that I've used for when I'm writing EPKs for other people. And these are the things that I ask them for before I start writing their EPK. Oh, and EPK stands for? Uh, electronic press kit. Electronic press kit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I know what it stands for. I know what it stands for. Um, so, uh, so, if you look at all of these uh, press press releases, they have all the information that I've asked for. So the band photo, the one, two, three high quality JPEGs, iPhone photos don't work. You have to find a friend who has a camera and it's 2019, <laughs> so super easy to do. Um, like Erin said, which is a good tip, is like a horizontal and a vertical. Um, and I also have in the section, why do I include it? They can publish immediately. They don't have to. Uh, for example, if you're, um, I had Jen Dirksen working for me for the Manitoban, so that was really great because Jen had like a ton of photos of all sorts of bands. You generally won't have that privilege of having the photo editor have pictures of you, so you need to send those in. Um, the biography, er, uh, I would say, it's important to have all that information ahead of time so that you can sort of build your story. With the biography, the contact info, I would say somebody that will answer in less than a day. And make sure it's someone that you want to be talking to the media, <laughs> for sure. Because I interviewed someone who was horrific. He was awful and said all these like very like cocky things about the band. And I was like, if that's what you want your image to be, I'll publish it. And then I got in trouble from the singer because they gave me the drummer's information. It's like, don't give John that information then, duh. Um, it's helpful include, <laughs> this sounds ridiculous, I'm saying these, this is actual real life examples. Yeah. Um, 
helpful if you include things that are sense like influenced by don't put the Beatles obviously you know like actually find some like actual uh, people that ask your friend who you sound like or, or what you remind them of it's kind of helpful or any festivals that you've played good bands that you've played with or popular bands that you've played with I have like an example like open for Juno winning band Five, Five Alarm Funk which is you just beef yourself up by beefing them up, you know? Um, all of these things are included because 90% uh, of your article will be written off of the press release and then the 10% or up to 50% is based on um, your quotes, right? So this is super important because your biography and what's coming up and all the things about that you're doing the release about is important and the person that is making up the other 50% of the article is super important. Uh, anything yet? No. no. <laughs> so, tour dates, times, locations of all the places that you're going to be going, because uh, if you're playing in Saskatchewan and pitching to the University of Saskatchewan, it's important that they know that you're going there. So, all of those things included, um, and also look at all the places that you're going and do, if you have 10 dates, do 10 minutes of research on each of them and spread it out through the day, do it on the bus, find out... Uh, like we were saying, who is the, the editor at the time, all those types of things. Sorry, I'm just gonna add, yeah, sure. these things are mostly geared to band things, but all of these, this information is applicable to every one of your events as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, so social media handles, as you can see in Aaron's press release, Instagram, Facebook, SoundCloud, Bandcamp, uh, videos, live performances, um, all of that is important uh, if you're not a band, all of those things except SoundCloud Bandcamp are still important. Um, yeah, and they'll also be looking if I'm like, um, if a band from Saskatchewan wants to play in Winnipeg, I will go to their Facebook page and see six people from Winnipeg are interested, or six of your friends like this band, or six, you know, you can see on Facebook, it's a super easy way to do it. It's like, okay, if six people are gonna read my article, then I'm not reading, meeting my quotas and my editor's gonna be like, why are you writing an article about um, for six people? Um, and that adds on to start inviting people to follow your accounts. If you, for example, um, another band is opening for, me for, opening for you from Saskatchewan, ask them to post that you're playing coming up, start following some of their followers, start following some of their band members, start getting all of that engagement from other places that you're touring so that uh, when I go onto your Facebook page, not only six people from Winnipeg like you. Uh, it's important to keep track of uh, other publications that have talked about you in the past. So um, the way that I write pre press releases, when I do write press releases for other people is at the top, I'll say, um, like, Stylist says this, the Manitoban says this, uh, CBC says this, all at the top, the quotes, about your band or your project or something. So every piece of information that somebody's ever written about you, you should keep that in a folder or something and kind of at the top. So if the Uniter says, this is the best band I've ever seen in the world and that's right at the top of your press release, well, I'm gonna read that article and find out why you're the best band in the world. And this includes, I put here, like it's also helpful if someone in the band or multiple members have been in another project <coughs> before or an artist, or something has been part of another project before. So my example is like tight, tight rhythm section, but if you have the same rhythm section as um, the Joe Schmoes is now in your new band, that's still a tight rhythm section, doesn't matter which band they're in, so you can uh, say our rhythm section is the one that the United says is tight. You know what I mean? Okay, cool. Does it matter if the quote is old? Doesn't matter. If, if you, I mean, if you're the best band in the world and they said that in 1990, you're still the best band in the world, right? Uh, <laughs> so the more people that you can prove that are interested in what you're doing, uh, the better. So it's not so much, quality is important. I mean, like put like the CBC at the top or put the Winnipeg Free Press at the top. Um, but also keep in mind that like the big, bold statements, like take advantage of like the brand new person at the Manitoban that's only seen three bands and think you're the best one in Winnipeg, like put that at the top, like cool, like if somebody's 
saying those important things about you. That's really cool. Uh, and then all these other things, give it at least two weeks, make sure you're kind of accommodating. Uh, this is the most important thing. Well, not the most important thing, but it really, really bothers me when somebody doesn't post or share the article after I do it, or post or share the interview after I do it, it is a sh almost a sure thing that I will never write about you or talk to you ever again. Because the reason that I am writing this is like not for anyone except for your fans, I think. Well, like, I mean, to make new fans is a good thing, but also like, if I'm writing an article about like, well, can you and I'm all excited and writing all these things down and then they never post it. It's like, I spent a lot of time on you and you can't even, they didn't do this, but like you can't even post all this like six hour, 10 hour research that I did and how am I gonna share this with anybody? Like, I think it's really important to be grateful for the time that, and effort that somebody put into you. Um, and if something's uh, wrong in the article, uh, don't share it or post it until you've corrected that. So. We're doing these research projects and sometimes if there's like a typo or something, uh, get that fixed and then post it right after those things are fixed. If there's like a picture you don't like that maybe like somebody posted that's a, a different drummer from a long time ago and you want your new picture posted or something, don't post that article and then say something because it also, there's a whole bunch of things like with renewing and stuff on the websites that it won't post immediately and all this type of thing and then you'll have to repost it and then nobody would have read it and blah, blah, blah. Just make sure that you contact them with any mistakes. With oh, and don't feel bad about correcting mistakes no. either. Sometimes people get a little weird and they don't want to like offend anyone, but if I make a mistake, like tell me and I'll get it fixed as soon as I can. It happens, like you write too fast or you have a typo or you misheard something, mistakes happen. Just approach it calmly and respectfully, which does not always happen, <laughs> but we, we, we will fix it as soon as we can. And yeah, the calmly and respectfully is important because if you, the newsroom is a funny place. Like if you, yes. <laughs> if you say like, doesn't matter how big you are, if somebody says that John Smith is a jerk, then nobody's writing about John Smith because you put John Smith. Mm. Yes. <laughs> It's just important to remember that the people working with you are also people. We're not content producing robots, which is a common misconception, and mistakes do happen, and you just fix them and move on. the free press has a paywall so um, I understand that not everyone is going to be a subscriber not everyone is going to be able to read that article it's a little different with the Manitoba Unite or whatever else but um, yeah I love it when people take pictures and tag me in it tag the paper in it um, because our print layout people work really hard on how those stories look in print and for them to take a picture of it and post it that kind of gives them a little extra props as well which is kind of nice any other questions break time cookies yeah, okay, let's take a little break, maybe like 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll reconvene.